Hello everyone, Pino and Apple here with the first story of a new big finish range, Dark Gallifrey, Morbius. Obviously this set is a story about the Time Lord Morbius, not the Vampire. Split into three parts, one per month, much like the Sontarans vs Rutan set, which was four stories once per month. The next series of Bernie Summerfield audios getting the same treatment. Perhaps Big Finish are attempting some new structure, coming away from constant box sets, and while it will take a while for me to relate well with this new structure, I am pissed every time a box set releases, and Big Finish are too lazy to give each story their own artwork. To use the 8th Doctor as an example, in his box set era Dark Eyes, Doom Coalition, and Ravenous, four box sets, four stories apiece, all had a piece of artwork per story. While Stranded and stories between What Lies Inside and In the Bleak Midwinter now rely upon fan artists for their individual stories. The Dark Gallifrey line itself consists of eight three-part stories over the coming years. Currently confirmed are The War Master and, of course, Morbius. But looking at the line's trailer, we can expect stories featuring The Nun, Missy, the Eric Roberts Master, Rufus Hound's Monk, leaving two entries we know nothing about. But personally, I hope it's not more Masters, unless it's an audio only like Alex McQueen. Perhaps we can get one of the incarnations of the Collective, or as known by TARDIS Wiki, The Multitude. But where that name came from, I have no idea. Maybe the Rani, or perhaps a bigger threat such as Omega or Rassilon. With the speculation of the line out of the way, let's get into the first episode. And since I'm writing these as I listen to them, month by month, I'll review them as separate episodes of one story. First, we'll take a look at the cover of part one. The editing is nice, although I'm not too fond of the makeup on the sister of Khan. And the effects to represent the Burning Man and Morbius are interesting too. Now into the story. We are narrated by a character named Narata, played by Janet Henfrey, known for being in both classic and new Who, in The Curse of Fenric and Mummy on the Orient Express, who gives a pretty good performance for a glorified narrator, really selling the scale and drama of the story as she describes the horror and cruelty, but also the hope that Morbius perpetuated in his time vying for power. In Morbius's final days, as we know from the show, he ended up on Khan, presumed dead. And a piece of him yet to end up given a new body in the vengeance of Morbius. He led a civil war, shredding the vortex with battles, and is eventually defeated, his defeated warriors and cultists being brought back as prisoners to be tried back on the homeworld. After this, we get to hear the series theme, or what I assume is the series theme, whether it's specifically for Morbius or Dark Gallifrey as a whole, is to be seen. But it's a nice piece, haunting screeches, organ-like climbs, and a little electric flavour. Nothing amazing, but different from most themes. More foreboding than triumphant, such as the Doctor Who theme and, say, river songs or units. We finally get to meet our main characters, seemingly a group of Gallifreyans who have not been inducted as Time Lords, or what in future Gallifrey will be referred to as Shabogans. Only the captain having ever been given the chance to regenerate, and it leaving them as a different gender and sporadically sane. Being Captain Argento, played by returning Big Finish actor Rachel Atkins. Other notable members of the crew include the ship's second-in-command, the people's person, Mr. Middlewitch, played by another long-returning actor, Hewell Morgan, and the put-down-upon aspiring-for-a-higher-position crew member, Rolko, played by returning actor and a fave of mine, Mina Anwar, in probably the only role she's been in that I'm not too fond of. Not because of her acting or anything, but the character's journey was frustratingly clear and predictable. Rolko displays this annoying characterization as a sister of Khan arrives to board the ship, Gilda, played by Lara Lemon, a great name for another returning but more recent big Finnish actor. And Gilda seems to be more of the viewer's main character than the others. Other than being front and centre on the cover, she gets a vast amount of screen time and her interactions act as our best early way of interacting with the characters before the others get scenes amongst themselves. Gilda is invited into the ship by Middlewitch, accompanying the crew back to Gallifrey for the cargo she holds, while Rolko whines. You have no idea how many takes it took for me to get that three-word sentence right. Gilda and Middlewitch work off each other well. Well, Middlewitch works off pretty much all the characters well. 
Gilda is carrying a package for the captain, and I do appreciate the use of naturally unveiling information. There doesn't seem to be a lot out of place exposition-wise. Information such as the captain changing genders or her sickness are conveyed through either natural explanation or clever inference. Middlewitch gets a badass line, and we get a view into the brig where Rolko verbally pisses off the prisoners, using ood as a derogatory term. And we get introduced to Morbius properly through his vessel. There are a race of tentacle Cthulhu looking people who carry the souls of those that die close to them within them. Although in reality it's probably just their minds trapped in some sort of psychic ability, not the souls. And this one, Veritas, played by Andrew French, harbours Morbius within, who is layered in a lot of sometimes annoying effects, but played by returning Morbius actor Samuel West. Morbius controls his followers strangely, and Gilda is introduced to the newly feminized captain, her purpose being aboard to give the newly regenerated souls some of the sisterhood's vaunted elixir to quell the regeneration instability, as experienced by the captain as a sort of cross between a bad hangover and insanity. The higher-ups want to keep this business under wraps, doing well to set up the possibility of a mutiny that brews through the story. And with a mention of Marin from the brain of Morbius, the captain makes it quite clear that no one wants Gilda here before sending her off. The ship sets sail into the vortex, and in a scene with a good dynamic, the captain divulges to Middlewitch that their trip will be longer than they thought, receiving a hypercube from Gallifrey informing them of the damage done to the Vortex, meaning they won't arrive any time soon. Morbius speaks to Veritas and tells an interesting story of his first journey off-planet, and for a scene that shouldn't be very interesting, the performance paired with the ambiance really sells the character. It looked so small and fragile as we flew away. So I lined up my hand against the viewport, getting the perspective just right, and I pretended I was crushing it. Gilda is brought from her cabin, surprised that it's been days since they left, time travel having interesting effects on the crew, and she's offered a tour of the ship by Middlewitch. They have some funny misunderstandings regarding the ship, and also being the second time I can recall that Doctor Who felt the need to give mundane birds an origin story. Ravens and Eaters of Light, and now crows seemingly having been from the Vortex before the fighting sent them away to worlds such as Earth. That really didn't need to be here, but I appreciate the slightly ridiculous world building. Middlewitch is given some info by Relco, their stores having been affected by the movement of a wall with seemingly no explanation, but also almost tipping off Relco about the whole long travel time thing, that under order from the captain he is not to divulge. Later at dinner, the captain freaks out about her new body and insults the sisterhood, salty that the only reason they were on Khan was due to a treaty between them and the Time Lords. It's now that the captain almost divulges the news about the travel time, but there is a commotion outside, an elder officer dying of shock in the crow's nest, and a shimmering man comes through the vortex, a man in pain. I imagine the effect on his skin being like a dormant regeneration, such as when Capaldi playing 12 refused to do so and kept glowing. The man is brought aboard, and the crew really want to throw him back out, but Gilda saves him as he starts rambling. And while the words are suitably cryptic, while seeming to have meaning, and after writing the reviews of the other two, a fair few amount of the things he says do come back. Rolko is getting salty about this new body business, and having pissed off the captain is thrown in the brig, and the shimmering man is for the time being, until he can be interrogated, relocated to Gilda's quarters. Veritas tells Morbius of the appearance of the shimmering man, his mind at odds with Veritas. They get all culty together and the Shimmering Man continues to freak out, but mentions the captain by name, making me propose this may be a member of the crew from the future or some such. I was very wrong. The captain and Middlewitch get another decent dialogue scene, but the captain continues to need the elixir. Rolko is talked to by Veritas, who attempts to build a friendship between the two, sowing more discord. Discord! But as hinted at before, the walls shift together, making the dimensions of the room smaller than before, as seems to have been happening since the grain incident. Gilda comes to see the captain, wanting to give the Shimmering Man an elixir, but she pretty vocally tells Gilda to fuck off. And the captain gets further on edge with Middlewitch, smashing her mirror in a fit of emotion, still struggling to reconcile with her new body. Rolko is out of the brig and quite bitchy to Gilda, immediately almost pissing off Middlewitch, 
before informing him of the walls enclosing, the interior dimensions of the ship failing. The captain makes her way to Gilda's room, and in a moment of weakness, wanting to know what the glimmering man is talking about as he seemingly spits out prophecies about grandchildren and islands of death, so she allows the use of one of her elixirs to heal him. Rolko heads back down to talk to Veritas, who explains his abilities with a pretty natural and impressive speech of exposition. And once done, Morbius starts to seemingly manifest and marks Rolko with a tattoo or mark that seems to be some sort of initiation. Not exactly explained, but easily inferred. Hopefully the next parts expand upon this, because I'm not sure I like Morbius becoming a cheap Lord of Voldemort with the marks and resurrection, starting as a spectre living in the head of an acolyte. And I really don't want to see a little naked baby Morbius wrapped in a cloak. It's been eight weeks on the ship now, and the captain finally tells the crew that they have no idea when they'll be getting home. But mid-speech, she's hit with a wave of pain, her condition worsening. They think of sending a message home, and Middle Witch tells her that the crew are getting antsy. But she has a backup plan. The Horn of Rassilon? Supposedly, when called, he will come, but Middle Witch doesn't seem to believe her. Making the schism larger, the crew are salty, they haven't been given the Time Lord bonuses like the captain. And Middle Witch storms off, ready to chew Gilda out, telling her she never should have given the Shimmering Man the elixir. And if the crew knew he was still there, they might stir into a panic, which does happen, led by Rolko. Gilda able to see the mark on her arm, as Rolko starts to insinuate the man and Gilda are the cause of the dimensional destabilization. And due to this shit, Middle Witch calls Rolko out, barely not shoving her back in the brig. But Rolko tells him that they trust him more than the captain. Maybe we should get you working in the vents. I won't cool off in there. That's hellfire work. If it keeps you out of trouble... And how long will I be venting for? Rolko is deeper in the cult and discusses how Middle Witch may join them. Veritas tells her his story, pretty haunting and creative in the writing and performance, even with the Hydran's voice effects. The captain is spinning even more out of control, stumbling around like a schizophrenic drunkard, as she regrets giving the elixir away, as the Shimmering Man still recovers. And everything goes to shit as Middle Witch tells the crew if something has to be done, he'll do it, most likely alluding to him taking command over the sick woman. And he even lashes out at Gilda for a hot second, but screams start coming from below deck as the crew are being crushed since Rolko tells us they were unfortunately locked in. I wonder how that happened. They spout more witch-fearing stuff as even more crew members have taken the dark mark. And the cliff is hung for part two as the Shimmering Man's warnings come true when the ship sees an island, everyone bracing for impact just as Middle Witch is about to take command. A pretty good cliffhanger filled with controlled chaos setting us up well for a part two. So that was Morbius part one, a pretty good setup for the trilogy. The characters were well done, even if not all entertaining. Rolko, for example, being fucking annoying, but by design. And the captain, Middle Witch and Gilda all getting pretty good stuff, and especially Middle Witch being explored and sympathetic. Unfortunately, it fails a little as it's called Morbius, and he is one of the least featured characters. A problem which will become bigger in the next Dark Gallifrey line. But the characterization he is given in those little scenes and the narration at the start are all written well, and the performances from Janet Henfrey and Samuel West do a lot to sell it. And as a part one, it sets up the next two parts well. Something else it gets right is the atmosphere. Sure, it sets up like a Gallifreyan pirate ship, which is quite strange and doesn't feel like it fits anywhere in Gallifreyan lore, but it sticks to that route and does it pretty well. So I'll give part one of Morbius, and I really feel like these parts should have subtitles, an 8 out of 10. Thank you everybody so much for watching this video of Morbius part 1. I'll be back very shortly with Morbius part 2. Please like the video if you liked it. Comment down below if you wish. Consider subscribing to the channel and if you do, ring that notification bell so you're told every single time that I make an upload. Once again, thank you for watching and I will see you in the next review. Bye! Toast. A little piece of toast. Because there's so much to choose from. There's brown bread, white bread, all sorts of wholemeal bread. It comes in friendly packages, but writing on the side.